Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, Mike had a, an emergency of some sort at work, and he called to see if uh, my daughter Julia could host this evening. Uh, unfortunately, she was busy, so it's phoned to me. <laughs> so I'm going to fumble through this, so just bear with me, and we'll, we'll get through it. Okay, where, where do we go next? Okay, so tonight's program. Okay, we've got Dave Chisholm with the Sky this month. We've got Al Scott with the 10 minute uh, astronomy news update. And then Tim Cole's presentation that was postponed from earlier on celestial navigation. Then we'll have a short break. And we're gonna have Ryan Anderson <coughs> on next generation satellite technology, observation reports, announcements, and then door prizes afterwards. So don't forget to get your ticket for the door prize at the break, and uh, you don't have to be a member. Everybody's welcome, okay? So let's start off. David? i uh, got a bunch of new members this month. We'd like to welcome them. You can read the names up there. Um, okay, oh, members in the news. Yes, okay, members and friends in the news. Okay, so we've got um, Graham Hayes' brother, Andrew, is working at Carleton University on a Mars rover. There's a tie-in with NASA as well. Next, uh, Pierre Martin has uh, in uh, Sky News, photograph in Sky News. For those of you who haven't, aren't familiar with Pierre's work, it does gorgeous work on uh, photographing meteorites, and meteors, meteor showers. Next. And we have Michael Wolfson, is in uh, this month's uh, Sky and Telescope. Okay. And there's one other, we didn't get time to get the photo in here. Uh, Stuart Glenn um, had his first sketch published in Astronomy Sketch of the Day back in May 6th. Okay. Good. So the sky this month for, for June. Uh, next slide, please. These are the uh, moon phases, and uh, you've already missed the full moon by now. It was on June the 2nd. In July, we're going to have uh, two full moons, so we'll have a blue moon in, uh, in July. Next slide, please. June the 11th, uh, asteroid Tupalus is at opposition in Hercules. You need to sort of see where those little red dots are there. That's uh, this picture is June 11th at around 10.30 in the evening. The next one uh, is in uh, just a straight out of Sky News from uh, May and June. So you, if you uh, get your Sky News, this gives you uh, maybe a better idea of being able to pick that out in the, uh, in the sky. Next one. Now, this is an interesting project. This is uh, from the Planetary Society in the States. And they have a, what's called a cube satellite. It's the size of a loaf of bread. And it's been launched. They've had a few technical difficulties since it's gone up. They had a software glitch that caused the, an overload. Um, it got rebooted, thankfully, by a uh, charged particle, uh, which apparently happens uh, fairly frequently with these little satellites. Um, now they're having battery problems. The uh, original plan was to deploy the sails today, um, right now, until they can get the batteries back online, uh, it may be a while. However, once the sails are deployed, they're 18 feet by 18 feet, and uh, they should be visible in the, uh, in the uh, ev evening sky. The website is up there, so I encourage you to visit that, and they give you an idea of where things are, where things are at. The solar sails were de deployed on Jan June the 3rd, and uh, if you think of a, a figure skater, to slow themselves down, they put their arms out. Well, they, one of the problems they had with this particular satellite was it was spinning out of control. As soon as they deployed the solar cells, it, it slowed down. Unfortunately, the solar cells are not charging the battery right now. So we'll see what happens. Next slide, please. Um, I think we missed one. Um, or my pages are out of order. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I don't have the image in front of me here. 
So June the 28th, we have a lunar occultation. And um, this is an interesting one because the lunar occultation is when the edge of the moon blocks uh, a particular image. In this case, it's the uh, 4.1 magnitude star, uh, Theta Libre, and it's a binary star, but it's uh, point 0 0.05 degrees apart, so you really can't see it. However, when, sorry, whenever this occultation occurs, uh, there could be a 0.1 or 0.2 second delay, and you might be able to see something happening there. Uh, apparently, people in the past have seen it. Uh, so that's on June the 28th at um, 11.03. Next slide, please. So Mercury is not visible this month, uh, maybe towards the end of the month, 4.05, possibly, but uh, basically it's not visible this month. Next slide. Venus. Uh, it's setting uh, between midnight and 11.06. Uh, greatest elongation is on June the 6th, uh, 45 degrees from the sun. Um, I'm going to come back to this one here on uh, June the 30th. There's going to be a, a 0 0.3 degree conjunction with Jupiter. That should be quite spectacular. Hopefully we have clear skies for then. Mars is not visible. Sorry, got to watch that mic. Uh, Jupiter, um, good visibility. Um, all month. Um, on the, um, as I mentioned before, on June 30th, point, 0 0.3 degrees apart. Low in the evening sky. If we flip to the next slide, that's, that's what it would look like at 9.38 in the evening on June the 30th. Next slide. Saturn. It's visible all month and uh, you get some really good images of, of Saturn the way it's uh, tilted right now. Uranus and Neptune, both visible all month. The International Space Station, uh, best viewing date is June the 13th. This is at a reasonable time, uh, 10 and 18 in the evening. Rises to uh, 69 degrees in the sky, so it's, it's getting uh, fairly far overhead. And if we flip to the next slide, you can sort of see the path uh, that, it, uh, that it takes. Now, uh, next month, for uh, July, uh, I'm not going to be here, but I have done the slides for the sky this month for July. So if somebody could see me at the break who's going to be here in July, I will give you the notes pages, and all you have to do is, is read them and say, next slide, next slide. It's fairly straightforward. I thought this was an appropriate uh, cartoon for uh, tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, David. What's up? Ah, thanks. So I guess that little note on the, uh, the little cube satellite with the sail is demonstration, almost conclusive, that Murphy's Law does extend into outer space. Uh, next up is Al Scott with our 10-minute astronomy news. Thank you, Bert. Good evening. So I've got a couple uh, quick items for you this evening. But before I go to my slides, there was one item, I think we have time to cover it, uh, that just uh, caught my attention as I was reading through some of the astronomy news reports. Um, some of you may be familiar with the so-called fast radio bursts that have been discovered by the Parkes Radio Telescope. Um, these are radio bursts that last for a few hundred milliseconds, so less than a second. They're very fast and they've been detected seemingly randomly across the sky. It doesn't seem to matter where the telescope was pointing. They, they've, they've caught maybe a dozen of these uh, radio bursts. And the frequency spectrum of these bursts is such that it seems like they've passed through a lot of uh, interstellar dust, like from billions of light years away. And if this is the case, then the brightness of the source is tens of thousands of times brighter than anything we know of other than the most powerful black holes. So people have been wondering what these things are and there's been a lot of speculation about what, what they are and there was a paper that came out recently looking at the what's called the dispersion measure of these things which tells you how the delay of the pulse changes with the frequency and it's found that all of these pulses seem to be clustered around integer multiples of dispersion and what this has led some astronomers to think is that it's probably some sort of artificial source. Um, and so recently, um, astronomers at the park 
uh, observatory were exploring what could possibly cause this, and they found that apparently someone had been opening the microwave door at the observatory <laughs> before it had stopped. Well, there are quite a few interesting papers out there, and you look through the history of this. Wow. So, yeah, so good discovery. They were correct. It was an artificial origin, and <laughs> they've tracked it down. So just let this be a lesson to you. If you go to work at a radio astronomy observatory, don't open the microwave. Press stop first. <laughs> so, on to the uh, other news. Uh, I thought I would uh, preview a little bit about Pluto and its moons. As the, the New Horizons spacecraft, NASA's uh, Pluto uh, Explorer, will fly by Pluto on July 14th of this year at 11.50 universal time at, at a speed of approximately 13.8 kilometers per second, the fastest probe, the fastest man-made object in existence, actually, after 113 months en route. Due to the limited time available, there's a very high data rate, and they have high resolution cameras on this instrument. It's going to have the best, it's going to snap the best pictures ever of the system. However, because it's nine light hours away, uh, the data rate that it sends back is very low. So it will actually be sending, it'll be snapping pictures as it shoots through the system at the speed, but it'll take 16 months for all the data to come back from all the instruments. So we'll, we have over a year's worth of interesting data that's going to come back from this probe if everything works correctly when it passes through. So here's some interesting things. Uh, on the left there is a, is a photo uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, and there's a band in the middle that's put there to block out some of the light from Pluto and Charon to see the dimmer moons of Pluto. Astronomers have identified five moons of Pluto. Why does such an otherwise nondescript minor planet have so many? Their orbits are packed together so tightly, it's a puzzle how they got there and why they haven't been disrupted. The system was almost certainly created by a giant impact event in which two large bodies collided and spewed fragments into their vicinity. These bodies eventually became Pluto and Charon, and the fragments became the other four moons. The strongest evidence for this theory is that each of the planets orbit, or each of the moons orbits in the same plane. If they were captured moonlets, you would expect that the planes of their orbits would be a little bit different or random. Also, Pluto has a, a highly tilted rotation axis with, compared to the plane of the solar system. So all of these things taken together suggest that this system is the result of an impact. Now, Pluto and Charon are a binary planet. It's not really, it, it's almost like a two similar massed objects. It's the nine to one mass ratio. So, Charon does not actually orbit Pluto. The, boat, the two of them orbit around their epicenter, or the barycenter. The center of mass is outside of the planet Pluto. So there's not actually a central... Uh, you can't say that the Charon order orbits Pluto, but they both orbit each other effectively. Now, because they're a binary system, this means that it has interesting effects on the orbits of the moons. Their orbits aren't perfect ellipses. They have squiggles and they're perturbed quite often by the, by the different positions of the planets. And one would expect that they would collide and fly into each other and then fly away. So, so the, the mystery is why they're still there in, in these tight orbits, because they're so close together. The solution appears to be that there's a special three-body resonance in their orbital periods between Hydra, Styx, and Nix, uh, the three seen on the left-hand side here. Their orbital periods are, are synchronized so that they never line up in a row. And this would, would create a gravitational disturbance that could potentially disrupt the system. So that's an interesting uh, solution to the problem. Also, another thing that's interesting, except for Saturn's moon Hyperion, virtually all moons in the solar system are tidally locked to their parent. And what this means is that typically the moon orbital period is the same as its rotational period, so that the same face, like our moon, faces the planet, its primary, all the time. That's not the case with these moons. They actually have some sort of a chaotic relationship, and astronomers theorize that perhaps it's because it's a 
dual system rather than a single planet that they're orbiting that they can't lock on to that single primary. They keep be getting chaotic nudges here and there and they're not able to actually lock on. So that's an interesting uh, find as well. The final mystery, of course, is that in the artist's impression on the right, you can see the uh, apparent brightness of these objects and the one called Kerberos is extremely dark compared to the other ones and nobody really knows why. So that's uh, something hopefully the, uh, the New Horizons mission will let shed some light on uh, over the coming months. Speaking of Hyperion, uh, the Cassini spacecraft, still in orbit about Saturn, uh, took its uh, last close approach to the moon and, and shot back some, uh, some photos. Hyperion is the largest of Saturn's irregular moons. It's irregular because it's not uh, spherical. This moon is 360 by 266 by 205 kilometers in size, like a potato, and it seems to be the remnant of a giant collision itself. The reason we think that is because of its extremely low density. The density of this moon is roughly half that of water. It looks like a sponge. And the reason is, is that astronomers think it's basically just a loosely held rubble pile with spongy holes in it. 40% of it appears to be porous holes. During this re most recent flyby, Cassini passed by Hyperion at a distance of 34,000 kilometers. Interestingly, because of its low density and weak surface gravity, anything that hits it blows material off into space and the material actually doesn't settle back onto the planet, so it leaves very sharp-edged craters. Al, are the holes a vacuum? Yes. That would be expected. On the, on the bottom of these, though, that, that actually is dark material. On the bottom of these craters that we're seeing, there seems to be a lighter material over a darker um, surface. So. What actually happens when an impactor hits this is that it actually tends to compress the surface uh, rather than a typical cratering scenario. So a very odd and interesting uh, world uh, and it also you know, perhaps very similar to the moons of Pluto which seem to be results also of uh, collisions of icy bodies. So that brings me to the end. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Al. Okay, so next up, we have uh, our Vice President, Tim Cole. You may remember that, uh, not to put any pressure on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> but his presentation last year won the uh, Presentation of the Year Award, so. Tim? Well, greetings, everyone. Um, I'll take a very short moment for a small public service announcement. I uh, just actually got this little button in the mail this morning. Uh, this reads, for those who aren't up close, we support TMT, the 30 meter telescope. Uh, yes, it's gotten through all its hurdles, but um, well, there's still going to be all kinds of hurdles left to come. So uh, these ones are actually free. They're even, even mailing them. They're picking up the tab for it themselves. They're just looking for some good support. So head on over to their Facebook site, say hello and give them some love because they certainly deserve it, or at least I think they do. Now, um, what I'm going to take a look at is celestial navigation, which the sign says, which leads me to uh, an introductory comment. Um, I got a little bit of help on this from somebody who actually knows celestial navigation um, in the form of Brian McCullough, who when I told him I was doing this, he said, now let me get this straight. Which one of us has actually navigated a ship across the Atlantic? <laughs> And, of course, only one of us could put his hand up, uh, which wasn't me. So, now, normally, when some does book, you always read the story that, you know, I got all this help from mom, dad, sis, brother, um, but all the mistakes are my own. So, what I'll have to say is, I got everything from Brian, and all the mistakes are his. Um, anyway, seriously. Uh, now, why, and okay, I'm being a little silly there, but why am I taking this step of talking to you about celestial navigation when I haven't actually done it. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, because I don't really know. But, well, I mean, I know the basics. But what I'm trying to look at here is sort of the basics of it, the grounding of it. Why did we get to it, and what are we taking advantage of to make it happen? So in that sense, I think I'm, I'm reasonably well qualified for it. Oh, yeah, I know, wrong button. 
Um, the classic little bit here that I just sort of put on as a piece of whimsy, all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by, and if you haven't read it, by all means, check it out and look it up. I remember having to memorize it as a kid, but... Uh, so here we have the basic problem. We're out at sea, and where are we? Most of civilization, most of history, um, we really didn't have a very good idea where we were. Here's a nice little um, medieval map. And like many of the maps from this period, they're decoration. They're not actually all that useful for navigation, uh, largely because we really didn't have the means to make them. So as much as anything, these really were the toys of wealthy people. Um, it gave a rough idea of what was there, and certainly they were used to things like sketch maps, but as navigational devices, they really weren't very useful. So for a long time, the only real way to figure out how you were going to get around at sea was with a device known as a rudder, or I should actually say a book. The rudder is basically a pilot's guide, and in those days, the navigator of a ship was the pilot. And the whole purpose of this rudder was for a pilot to record everything he could possibly think of that would guide him from one port to another. So it would be compass headings, uh, prevailing winds, tides, currents, reefs, color of water, uh, material that would be stuck to the bottom of the sounding lead, anything that would help you get by. And this was how you really did it. You did it by what we would nowadays call pilotage you knew where to go. And really, once you got out of sight from, from land and you had no further references to go by, you really are stuck with this, I gotta know where to go, to know where to go. Now, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're a little smug. We'll, we'll sit here and say, yeah, we can find our latitude up here. And of course, you know, we're a little smug there because we've got our pole star, and I'll talk about that one in a couple of minutes. But really, when you come down to it, this is the whole problem. I'm stuck somewhere. I don't know where I am. What do I have that I can rely on? And of course, what I have to rely on is a sky that remains, well, at least as near as anyone can tell for a few lifetimes, remains constant. I mean, it's up there. I mean, it's moving in a predictable way, except for those dratted planets, but they'll tell you omens. Well, never mind. We won't go there. But this became something predictable that you would work with. So it didn't take too long, I'm sure, before people started realizing, if I'm traveling so that this star is always at the same altitude, well, I'm going east-west. And if I'm traveling so the star is in front of me, I'm going north. If I'm traveling so it's behind me, I'm going south. And probably didn't take too long before people realized I can figure how far north and south I am. So this is pretty good. But this is only a tiny, tiny part of it. One of the things we've got to do is figure out how to find this thing. Up here in the Northern Hemisphere, we're kind of lucky. In the Southern Hemisphere, as you can see here from this reticle, um, I'm not even sure where I stole that, other than Wikipedia Commons, but Southern Hemisphere certainly doesn't have it as, as good. But you can still figure out where that rotation point is with observation. You know, maybe you won't get it tonight, but you'll get it after a while. Um, now, we also, in addition to this, want to be able to figure out which way we go, and here's the classic marine compass. Nicely floated so it'll stay nice and level so it can tell us which way north is. Except uh, it's not north from Polaris, it's north from, well, something else. Magnetic north. And uh, uh, magnetic north is kind of a dodgy thing as you start going around the world, as you can see from this chart. Uh, there are some spots here where Magnetic North is a really, really unreliable, unguessable thing. So we, we did come up with some other methods to navigate, and my apologies to Chris. I finally found these puppies today after much looking. Uh, this is something I've been looking for. I first heard of it as a North Pointing Buddha. Um, that was how I first had it described to me, and it finally crops up as a South Pointing Chariot. Uh, none of these have ever been discovered, but there have been references to them in, in a lot of old Chinese literature. And as near as anyone can guess, it seems to be some kind of a crude differential system, though that's hotly debated. But the idea here is as you moved along, that differential, for want of you know, how else they actually did it, would you know, move the wheels side to side as you stopped going straight and would make the pointer move around. 
How accurate this thing could be, I really don't know. I, I seriously doubt that it was that accurate. I suspect it was more a, a, a conceptual thing than something that was ever really used, but you know, I could be wrong on that one. This one's a corker. This is a little piece of Iceland spar, and it's a birefringent crystal, which means basically it's a natural polarizer. And it's been speculated for quite some time that this is what enabled Vikings to navigate. These little puppies can let you find the sun when it's overcast, provided it's not too heavily overcast. And this was a problem that had baffled people for a very long time. How did the Vikings do their navigation? Because magnetic declination in the north is a dog's breakfast. You can go a little bit west and a little bit east and the compass just goes nuts. And then when you're up that far north, if you're not into the full midnight sun, you're still into the sun's up for huge parts of the day and doing navigation at night becomes difficult. And 2013, a wrecked ship dating back from 1592, um, I should remember it, yes, the Alderney was discovered, a wrecked ship discovered with one of these little sunstones found in it, right in with all the other navigational gear. So perhaps this was a good method of finding your way. Now, so far, all we've been able to do is figure out where am I with regard to the equator and which direction am I going? And that leads us to another little problem, and that was the problem of longitude. How far am I going east and west? And here's the catch. The equator is pretty easy to figure out. You can figure it out from the stars. You can figure it out from rotations. It's a physical thing. You can measure this, but you can't measure a reference point for longitude. It's completely arbitrary. There's nothing to, to designate where the zero point would be. When we do it for moon and planets and stuff, we pick some reference point that we can see. But that doesn't work terribly well down here. We're not above it, bird's eye, and the Earth resurfaces itself pretty frequently. Oh yeah, there's my reference point, except it's summertime and I can't see it for the bushes. There's my reference point, but it's winter time and it's snowy. So we don't have anything that will physically give us a cue. Well, except for this thing. There, there's the prime meridian. It's this big, I, I don't know, it looks something like a giant oversized sword hilt to me. You know, a, a big basket, uh, you know, big basket of a, some kind of a big, you know, pointed whacking stick. Um, yeah, I know the technical terms will kill you every time. Um, so this basically, that, that's our prime meridian. It's this piece of brass that went through the setting circles of Aries telescope. That's actually how they pinned it down. It went right through the axis of the setting circles. Now, um, actually, we've used this since, let me check here. Why did I not take my glasses? I'm, I'm at the age now where I have long arm sight. Um, Ah, yes. 1884, the uh, International Meridian Commission got together and said, yes, this will be it, except the French refused to vote. Uh, and they refused to accept Greenwich, and they did all the marine charts based on Paris, which I presume the Paris Observatory. And even into World War II, there were charts that were done from the Meridian of Paris. And I remember reading of one case where a navigator didn't realize this and assumed that it was the Meridian of Greenwich. So this becomes a problem. And lest you think that the problem hasn't gone away, here's a guy with a GPS receiver standing on the meridian strip. And if you take a look at the position, we see that in fact it is being reported as 5.3 minutes west because the WGS-84 reference that GPS uses, and that's based on the the, uh, the, the physical characteristics of the Earth is a little tiny bit off from Greenwich. So longitude becomes a real problem. Now, here is something that we can exploit for longitude, and this is time. Now, contrary to popular misconception, most people, at least most intelligent people, most learned people in the Middle Ages, bleeding well knew the Earth was a sphere, or at least spherical. Um, the only real argument was how big is it? So learned people knew that as the Earth was rotating, we were going to be able to see the sun moving. Even if they weren't able to take trains the way we can, they'd know in principle. So in principle, if you could somehow measure the time and relate it to your reference, then this ought to be able to give you a longitude. But how do you do it? Well, here's an example of a nocturne. It's the one I like carrying around. 
Um, as my wife likes to point out, it's from my favorite toy store, Lee Valley Tools. Um, yeah, I know, that's a dangerous, dangerous place. Um, and it's only 10 minutes away from my house. Um, yeah, actually she knows from the look of my expression whether I blow money there or at Focus Scientific. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, the problem with this, this can give you a reasonably accurate time, but you have to be able to find the Big Dipper and see it through the clouds. And with a lot of practice, you can get it to plus or minus 15 minutes some parts of the year. It's just not going to cut it as a time reference. So what other methods could we use to establish longitude? Well, there have been tons of them. One of the craziest ones I ever read of was a proposal to put picket ships all the way across, well, take picket ships and put them all the way across the Atlantic. And each picket ship would fire a gun so that you would know where the picket ship was. Now, how you established these picket ships and supplied them and kept them from drifting off, uh, well, you know, details. We're not gonna worry about this stuff. I'm not a detail man, I'm an idea man. This one showed a lot more promise because it didn't take too long before somebody realized these suckers move and they move predictably. So maybe we could figure out the time from these things. And let's take a look. Here it is three hours later. <laughs> There's quite a difference. Oh, rats. It's also changed position, which kind of makes it difficult to measure. But there is a time difference. And if we plotted these things at the Greenwich Observatory, then maybe I could compare the times they published to the times I'm measuring, and I can figure out how far apart I am in minutes. And actually, it turns out the method works. They even went as far as building Jovi Labes to pin down where these moons would be. So you could actually pull out the reference to the moons. Um, I'd love to find out how to make these puppies, but I could, never, I could barely find anything beyond the, uh, beyond the pictures. So uh, if anybody's got some kind of a better link for Jovi Labes, I'd love to see it. And I can bore you spitless with a talk on Jovi Labes sometime. Um, now, the big problem with this is it's tricky to do from a ship because you've got this rocking, pitching ship that you've got to measure from, and Jupiter isn't always available. But this actually is used for surveying on the ground. It's been used to pinpoint positions of, of uh, reference spots and such like on the ground. It's worked reasonably well. This was another method that was very hotly contested and, and really, really touted as the way to do it, and it was the lunars which was measuring the distance from the moon to navigational reference stars. And again, we take those precise differences, distances, and compare them to charts that were made for Greenwich, England. This is not the method that we use nowadays of taking a, a sight on the moon with a, with a sextant. That's a very different thing. What this was doing is it was taking precise measurements of angles to certain stars. And already you can see there's a, a massive can of worms here where should we measure it? I've shown this one as being measured from the southern cusp. Well, should it be the northern cusp? Or should it be the apparent center? Uh, not the apparent center, then you've got some other measurement issues. This stuff became such a horrible measurement problem that in fact there is at least one design for a special observing chair to be put on board a ship. And it looked a little bit like one of those little swing chairs that you can get. That, well, basically, I think it looked a bit like a rope with a tire on it and some guy sitting there with a special mask, and this guy's supposed to sit in there in a heaving ship and take these measurements, and then go away and do a, a whole pile of calculations and say, yes, we were here an hour ago. Um, <laughs> all right, it's not, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do on a ship. Again, this technique has been used on the ground to considerable accuracy, but um, this was hotly, this, this was a major, major method that was really heavily, uh, heavily pushed by quite a few people, including one of the uh, Astronomers Royal. Uh, one of the big killers with this, though, was that we didn't have a good lunar theory. Where is the moon? How do we predict where it is? This has been a, a really nasty problem for astronomy for, for decades, if not centuries. Um, and we've only really had a decent lunar model since, oh, I think early, 19, early 1900s. Um, and it's, it's a nasty thing to compute without actual computational help. So it, it's a bit, of a, a bit of a problem with the lunars. Ultimately, what it came down to was George Harrison, John Harrison's, like George Harrison, boy, I'm showing my age there, aren't I? Um, yeah, Freudian slip, or is that a Beatlean? Never mind, never mind, forget yeah, it. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 oh yeah, you love me. Anyway, never mind. Um, 
John Harrison and Carmen Rush could do a much better job telling you about his life than I can. Um, but basically, he was the guy that came up with a chronometer, a, a really, really accurate mechanical timepiece that you could reliably carry around. Uh, it went from a huge monstrous thing you can see in the picture there behind him um, to this tiny little thing that could be carried around. Uh, you, you could literally carry it in a big pocket in your coat. And this became a, quite a reference standard. You'd set this to Greenwich time and keep it wound, and this would be your reference time. This could give you now a precise distance difference in time between what you can measure now by stars or the, or the sun or the moon and Greenwich which should think, wow, this is cool, man. We're gonna go and buy a ton of these. <laughs> no, um, not really. Uh, this was not greeted with great raptures at the Longitude Board. Um, in fact, um, Harrison only got half his prize, and uh, the only way he got the rest of it was by an actual act of parliament. They actually gave him the, other, the last of his 10,000 pounds, which back in those days, this would have been millions and millions and millions of dollars. So the Longitude Board never did pay up. It was the Parliament that paid him. And this has remained pretty much the standard, even now. So now we face the other problem. The last picture I showed you was a nice, beautiful, pristine sky. We're in Ottawa. We don't have those. <laughs> And most places don't either. So, eesh, this imperfect sky thing is going to be a problem. We really have to come up with some other method of doing navigation. And as it turns out, we still do the celestial navigation trick, but in a way that doesn't seem very obvious. It certainly didn't seem terribly obvious when I first read about it. And here is the trick. What we do is we measure stars, but we don't directly use them to get time. We use time, we need the time to do the job, but we do something different. Now, I'm taking a little bit of a digression here. The Southern Hemisphere, we all know there's no convenient South Celestial Pole. And we sit there and rather smugly say, and I said I'd get to this in a couple of minutes, well, up here in the Northern Hemisphere, we got it knocked. Well, sorta. We've got that little bugaboo of precession. Here's the position of Polaris with respect to the North Celestial Pole. It's going to keep getting a little bit closer over the next while. I think the closest it approaches somewhere around 2100. But let's look at it 400 years ago, back at the period of great European exploration. It's not such a good match now. Now, it's not that bad. It's pretty close. It's workable. But Let's go back to around 400 common era. And this would have been around the time when we believe Tahitians, Polynesians, first stumbled onto Hawaii. And I'll get onto that in a second as well. At this point, the North Celestial Pole and Polaris are really getting quite far apart. And if we go back to the time of Caesar, we see a big variation between, and, and in fact, there isn't even any nice bright star near there. So, um, you know, never mind Shakespeare. I am as constant as the northern star, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's great, except Caesar didn't have one. Of course, poor old Shakespeare couldn't have known that. So I really question whether the Romans actually even had a concept of a pole star, or if they really would have had some method. I mean, they'd been able to figure out which way the pole was, but was there a handy star? Probably not. Now, here we have a retread from the last time around. One of the things is measurement tools. And here we have the classic Mariner's Astrolabe, the one that you always see in the pictures of Champlain and guys like that. And all this thing does is measure angles. That's its whole function in life. It doesn't do anything else. There's no computation. It's purely an angle measuring gadget. And it's actually not that easy to use, and it's quite expensive to make. So it didn't take long before people started basically subdividing it. You ended up with octants and sextants and quadrants, and the sextants seemed to fall out as the standard. But this thing still shows up. You find it in plotting tables. There's a fellow here who picked up a nice uh, drafting uh, protractor. Um, you see it in, uh, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce this, the ship's Pelorus or Polaris, I can't quite remember, sorry. And you see it in surveyor's transits. So this method is still around, it's still useful. But now let's take a look at what we use now. And that's, excuse me, 
the Mariner Sextant. Um, I brought a cheap one here. This is a $25 Davis Instruments Sextant, and uh, apparently um, this is actually good enough to get you across the Atlantic. Apparently uh, a sailor actually did with one of these little plastic thingies. And what this does is it basically takes the idea of the Mariner's Astrolabe and strangely enough from the complexity, it, it looks complex, but it actually simplifies the job. It's actually much easier to make this thing work. And the trick here is we have this moving arm and we have a moving mirror. So what we do with this is we actually, come on, be kind, be nice, there we go. What we actually do is we use that moving mirror to take what we're looking at and move it down to a reference plane. And this is what gives us a really accurate way of getting measurements. So now we can take really accurate angles to stars or the planet or the sun. Here's a quick uh, description of how it works. Um, I'm photographing through it. There is the neighbor's house behind and she has big male tenants. So you want to be careful with this. Um, and what I'm doing here is shifting the roof edge down to that line on the fence. And from that, I can get a very accurate measurement. And it looks like it would be tricky to do, but actually you can do it fairly quickly, even if you're a, a spaz like me. And uh, with, great pra with practice, you can get your measurements in seconds. So these things are remarkably good. So what do we do with it once we get it? Well, it turns out we can go to the moon with it because they had one of these things in the Apollo spacecraft. Here we have the Apollo sextant and scanning telescope. This is how you basically gave star fixes to the computer. Over here on the left is a simulation of what you'd see through the sextant. Of course, you know, they didn't have the, uh, the lettering. This is from the simulation. As near as I can tell, that website is gone. And it's a shame because you could, you could test, uh, they had simulations for all the missions. Uh, so you could actually duplicate the measurements that they made on the various missions, which I thought was way cool, but I'm a geek, what can I tell you? But uh, unfortunately, I can't find it. So again, if anybody can give me a, a point to that one, I'd love to see it. My wife might not, but I would. Um, so what do we do? We shoot a star. <laughs> Take that star. Never mind, I couldn't resist. Um, mind you, I can think of a few stars that probably need to be shot, but... Oh, sorry, those are reality TV stars. Anyway, never mind. Uh, so what we do is we take our sextant and we get a very accurate line to the star. Now, what does this buy us? Well, we don't use this to measure time. Here's the trick and here's how we do it. We have a honking huge stack of navigational tables that give us what we call GPs, geographic positions. What they list is the point that is directly underneath the star. It's a position that is directly underneath the star. Rise a vertical and hit the star. That's the point on the planet. So now we know an angle to a GP, to a, to a geographical position. Now we know we are a certain distance away from that geographic position. We have a circle of constant altitude. We're somewhere on that circle. Wow, that's really helpful. I'm somewhere, and some of these things you can actually measure from about 1800 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers away. So now I can know that I've got a, uh, let's see, about a 7,000 kilometer long locus that I could be on. Wow, is that ever helpful? Gee. But of course, that single measurement isn't going to do it. You have other things you can work with. Let's see how it works. We take our ship, uh, yes, I know, uh, marvelous graphics here, um, and take our star sight. We drop our vertical. We sweep out a cone and this is the circle that we're on. Notice we're not in it. We're on that circle. Now let's, let's do, this is the classic one that you always find in the books. The classic three star fix. So what we do is we take those three geographic positions and we draw circles around them and link them together. Now which stars do you use? It turns out that the handbooks are helpful there too. They list for any given time three stars to give you the best possible fix and a bunch of alternates. So they really do cover this. Where you are is at the intersection of those position plots. And this gives us a nice little spherical triangle. And what that triangle, according to some of the stuff I can read, is sometimes referred to is the cocked hat. You're in the cocked hat. 
You're somewhere in that spherical triangle. And that's usually pretty flinkin' good. Now, remember I mentioned that these geographical positions could be a huge distance away from your ship, and in fact, you, you actually, it turns out the math works a little better like that. Well, drawing those massive circles is a humongous pain in the patoot, so you don't do it. What you draw are what are called lines of position, and these are tangents to the circles. And it works exactly the same way. Up there, we have the uh, cocked hat again. But now the cocked hat is a plain, ordinary, plain triangle. Now this, by the way, I should point out, the chart's real, I stole it somewhere. Um, the lines are complete rubbish. Uh, I drew them on so it looked good. But it's the principle that you see here. And this is exactly how we do it. We figure out where we are compared to plot positions that are known to great accuracy. And we do a little bit of trigonometry and we're home. Or more correctly, we know how to get home. That's the trick that we've used for navigation for a very, very long time. And in some ways, it's almost the trick we use for GPS. We're using a position sub-satellite, but it's the same concept. Now, I'm taking, and now for something completely different, I had to put in a Monty Python reference, um, something that a lot of people had asked me about before, and I found it kind of interesting as well, was the period of uh, Polynesian exploration. Here we have a recreation of a Polynesian ocean-going canoe. Um, there's one of two, I forget the other one. This is, uh, oh man, I'm gonna kill the pronunciation. Uh, Hokulea in uh, Honolulu Harbor. These things are huge. So canoe, not exactly. These aren't the things that you paddle down the river. I mean, these, these are Viking longboats. Now, the Polynesian Voyaging Society has, was, was put together to try to recreate, how do you do the navigation? down yonder, um, and actually operated this particular ship over a one-year period, traveling, um, my mistake, two-year period, traveling over a chunk that was actually known as the Polynesian Triangle. This is a huge mass of the South Pacific. It's covering everything, Easter Island, uh, New Zealand, Hawaii, Tahiti, and this is, they, they used the old techniques to pull this one off. But how did one ever learn those techniques, and how do they work? And that becomes the real problem, because none of it was ever written down. This was a pre-literate, or more correctly, a non-literate uh, civilization. Not to say stupid, but they never developed the concept of, of writing. So how do we do it? Enter this chap here, a guy named Mao Piailug. Uh, this guy was a master navigator in a tiny little island in Micronesia. You see, what had happened is once the missionaries moved in down there, they declared that all the methods that they used to memorize these things, which were dances, chants, artwork, all that stuff was declared pagan and blasphemous and was ruthlessly stamped out. Even the language was forbidden. You weren't allowed to speak any of the local languages because they were all blasphemous and, and pagan and vile and sinful. The dances, gone. The artwork, destroyed. So, in most of Polynesia, everything vanished, except for a couple little back, well, backwoods, back seas spots where guys like this kept it up. Now, here's the interesting thing. He was unable to find apprentices who were willing to learn, which isn't surprising. This is an incredible task, making this stuff work. This is all non-written. It's all memory, every single bit of it, and we'll see what's involved in it. So what he did is he broke tradition and told outsiders, in particular the Polynesian Voyaging Society and a group of professors at the University of Hawaii in Manoa, how this all worked. All the techniques, as many of the chances he remembered, basically everything he knew about it. Uh, he ended up with an honorary degree uh, in, in, uh, you know, as a token of regard for his, for his efforts. Uh, and was quite well, quite well regarded uh, by, I mean, regarded and treated well from everything I can gather uh, right up to his death. We owe a tremendous amount to this guy because otherwise, with his death, we'd have lost everything. Now, is it valuable? It is historically, because it's a technique of, of traveling. What I'm gonna do here, this is stuff that's all come out of what P.I. Lug told us. This is a picture of the mental model that a Polynesian wayfarer, they didn't call themselves navigators, they were wayfarers, 
and I'll talk about that one in a second too. This would be the mental picture. A Polynesian navigator, a wayfarer, who was going between islands, was expected to know intimately the position of 220 stars throughout the entire year. That was what was required, and it took decades to learn this. How did you learn it? You went through longer and longer voyages. If you didn't come back, you didn't learn it. Uh, actually, that was one of his comments. How do you know if you got it right, they come back? It sounds funny, except it isn't. This, this was, I mean, this was a life and death thing. This was serious stuff. This was their trade. This was how they actually stayed alive. This is how they managed to move when an island got wiped out by a volcano. So, I mean, this, this was serious stuff. You learned with an apprentice, and then you went out yourself, and you lived or you died. Pretty serious stuff. Here's how you learn it in the first place. On the beach, on the sand, with seashells and songs. That's how you learn your mental compass. And I don't know about you, but the thought of taking a boat out to sea with that makes me sort of want to run around screaming, shouting, flapping my arms and saying, <laughs> where do I get my plane ticket? <laughs> they also took advantage of the canoe. And this is brilliant. If you look at the canoes, you'll find the outriggers are held on with these, um, there was a technical term for it that I can't remember, but basically these straps. The straps aren't arbitrary. They are very carefully placed, and they're very carefully placed to give you a standard angular reference. Um, in fact, the angular reference was the size of a standard chief's hut. So it was all quite standardized, and from a reference point on the canoe, you could measure your angles. It wasn't the mass because it had two, so there, there must have been a, a preferred seating position. Now, overlap that with your mental compass, and now you've got a pretty exhaustive view of the world around you and how that fits and how that works. And you take all the other stuff that you have on hand, like, you know, uh, waves and uh, stuff that got off the bottom of things that you threw off overboard to see how deep the water was. Starting to see a resemblance here? No? This is the Polynesian rudder. It's the reference handbook that the European sailors used before the days of navigation. Except here, because no one wrote anything down, it was remembered with chants and songs and dances and artwork, but it was a rudder. So in a sense, this wasn't actually what we nowadays would call navigation. This was wayfaring, and that's what they called it. This was a recipe to get from point A to point B. Now this is a bit like being given directions to your friend's place for the barbecue. And remember how those go. Well, you go, you come off the Queensway, you do three blocks, you go three blocks from the Queensway, and then you turn left at the Max Milk. And then you go two more blocks, and then you go take a little bit of dog leg around the tree, and then go, um, well, I don't know, a couple of clicks up the hill. Here's the problem with that. As soon as you get mixed up with it, you're lost. You're completely and totally lost. That's the problem with this. This system doesn't tell you where you are. It tells you instructions how to get from here to here. If you miss that, you're not coming back. So finding new routes and finding new places to go and finding new ways to get there was just as dangerous as it ever was. So this really adds a lot to the idea of navigation, how this, how this worked out. I mean, these were pretty gutsy people to pull this one off. But in the, in the, it comes down to the same thing, though, and it's taking advantage of that consistency, which is stars, to sort of give you a reference point to that fundamental question of where am I and where am I going? This couldn't quite tell you where you were, but it could tell you where you were going to go. We've come up with a system on our side where we figure out exactly where we are. And, of course, what are we doing now? We're totally forgetting it because they don't teach celestial navigation in navies anymore. Now, I have no opinion of that because it's a public gathering. Um, but anyway, so thanks, every, thanks everybody for uh, listening to the endless babble of somebody who never did navigate a ship, but uh, found it really interesting how the astro astronomical bits led to ways to do it. 
So thanks everybody, and uh, I'm very glad nobody has rotten vegetables because they're not allowed in here. But thank you all for your attention. You may now wake up. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, next up, we have a cartoon. Just like the movies. You look small cause you are far Light years out from here to there Your light's distorted by the air So you twinkle, twinkle, little star Adaptive optics shows you as you are Twinkle, twinkle, little star You must be a small pulsar Out away from Earth you drift This is a from your red shift Twinkle, twinkle, spinning star Degenerate neutrons are what you are Twinkle, twinkle, little star Supernova, au revoir You got so big, too big perhaps Electron capture core collapse Twinkle, twinkle, former star Black hole's all that you now are Little star, oh wait, actually, no, you're a meteor Breaking up in the atmosphere I wish I'd known you'd end up here Twinkle, twinkle, shooting star Became a meteorite that hit my car Thank you so much for watching. This video is a collaboration with two amazing guys, Zach Wienersmith of SNBC Comics and the illustrator Chris Jones. The video is also available as an ebook and print book. You can find info about that at minutephysics.com slash twinkle. So thank you so much for these guys for doing amazing work. The illustrations by Chris are incredible. Just love it. And the song was inspired by a comic that Zach drew. Again, go to minutephysics.com slash twinkle and you'll find a link to the ebook, print book, and song that you can download. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we're going to have a presentation by Ryan Anderson on satellite innovations. Ryan? All right, get myself organized here. Uh, thank you. I, that, that song was just perfect timing. I was singing the, the traditional twinkle twinkle to my, my two-year-old daughter not, not two weeks ago thinking, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, and, and thinking, I know exactly what they are. Why am I doing her such a disservice by telling her I don't and, and telling her a, di a diamond? And I thought, well, somebody should come up with the lyrics that, that tell kids exactly what stars are. So I'm glad that's there. Is that online? Is that online? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to look for that and, and learn the words to that so I can sing that to my daughter instead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe... Who's, who's talk? Oh, okay. Hey, Chris. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is forward. This is back. Okay. Uh, I, I see the date's been removed from my slides. I, uh, I want to apologize to everybody who is here on, in February hoping to hear me talk, and I, I had to bail on you. I, I do apologize. I was, I was bailing out my kitchen at the time, so uh, a bit of an emergency. And uh, thank you for, for having me back. I always like coming to, to talk to, to the group here at the RASC. Uh, if, if for no other reason than you at least pretend to be interested, unlike my wife at home. <laughs> she, she hates it when I do that bit. <laughs> I know she's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pick up. <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan Anderson. I have uh, been a, an engineer at Telesat for about 10 years now. And I'm currently with the Advanced Systems Division, uh, working specifically on innovations in the SATCOM industry. To give you a little kind of a, a broad overview of, 
of space and SADCOM as an industry, the, the, some of the global figures put the, the, the global space industry at about two to three hundred billion dollars. In Canada, that number is, is shrunk down to about a three billion dollar by revenue industry every year. Uh, of that, about 80% is satellite communications. And of that 80%, Telesat's annual revenues are about eight to nine hundred million dollars. So we account for just shy of about a third of, of Canada's space revenues. Uh, MDA and Comdev probably account for the other two thirds between them. Uh, that's how sort of big the big players in, in Canada are. Uh, Telesat's uh, been uh, a, a really great success story in the, in the SATCOM industry over the, the last 40 plus years of its existence, uh, ushering in a, a, a number of firsts, uh, first domestic communication satellite, first uh, use of, of just about every band uh, in, in SATCOM you can mention, first use of a, a dual band satellite. Uh, and the, the innovations continue, and that's sort of my new area, taking care of these, these innovative ideas and, and changes to the industry coming down the road. Uh, SATCOM has, has been really a, a success story riding on, on direct to home. So the Bell Express View dishes you see on the sides of people's houses, it's uh, really been the bread and butter of, of the entire industry for, for quite some time. And with, with great success, you, you kind of you know, maybe don't relax so much, but it, it becomes easy to, to advance and grow your business just by putting up another direct-to-home satellite and letting everybody put the dishes on and, and turn cable on. But what we've seen in the last, uh, you know, five, ten years is, is a real radical shift. As the, the, the SATCOM industries, the, the providers, uh, the Intelsats and Telesats and SES and, and uh, Utilsats, uh, keep showing great returns year after year, uh, people start to get interested. Uh, a massive uh, growth in the availability of capital offsets the traditionally high barrier to entry of, of satellite communications. It's uh, apparently easier to get your hands on, on three to six hundred million dollars to launch a satellite now than it ever was. Um, so with that you get, uh, get new entrants into the market with all sorts of different ideas on how to improve services and, and reduce the costs and uh, improve capacities uh, and, and driving a, a, a metric called cost per bit. So the total cost of, of the system divided by the, the number of megabits per second you can put through. Uh, so with the, the rise of the internet that has become one of the, the future driving metrics of the, of the SATCOM industry. So, uh, what I'm going to do is, is go through kind of a, a top-level overview of some of the things that are going on in the industry and that we're looking at and working at. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's sort of a... Are, are there any politicians in the room? Okay, good. This is what I call the, the politician level. So if you have any more technical questions, feel free to ask away. Uh, but it's, it's kind of at that low, hopefully everybody can understand level. Right? Um, no offense to politicians everywhere. Why not? <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, the, 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 the mainstay and the, and the real big advantage that satellites have over uh, traditional delivery systems, especially when it comes to, to cable as a good example, is you can put one satellite up there and, and have a very, very broad reach. So this is uh, ANIC F2's footprint for, uh, for KU and C-band. And you see with the one satellite, you can reach the entire continental US, Mexico, Canada, uh, and you can deliver broadcast uh, television services to anybody, anywhere in that footprint. Um, very good model for, for that broadcast direct to home. Uh, as I said, the internet is, is on a, a massive rise, and that's a, a bit of a different model. So if you have uh, a certain amount of capacity that you're spreading out as a broadcast, uh, it's much different when people want to talk back and get an individualized set of content going back, a two-way communication. Um, the, uh, the, the bandwidth is, is basically correlated to the number of, of bits of information you can, you can send up and down. 
So for that amount of bandwidth spread over the country, you have to share those bandwidths, share that, that amount of, of bits of information. So one way, and, and this is, you know, I, I use F2 because the, it's sort of the first of the, the term high throughput satellite. Uh, how we get high throughput is by reusing frequencies. So this slide is, uh, is a real, <laughs> this is my graphic slide of a, of a broadcast Canadian coverage beam, uh, and actually four beams. So if we imagine each of these is a, a certain set bandwidth of say 100 megahertz, a typical broadcast satellite might put four such beams down and sell that to four different customers, to Bell, to Shaw, to Telus, to whoever is broadcasting. Um, so that would give you, you know, We'll say it's one to one, and you get 400 megabits per second down. So what Anik F2 ushered in was frequency reuse by shrinking the size of that beam and reusing beams over and over. And I use four color just to denote a, a four color reuse scheme. So this next slide, uh, my antenna guy would kill me because this is a terrible lay down of, of beams, but uh, these circles represent uh, high throughput spot beams. So the, the spots are much smaller, uh, but you get the same 100 megahertz into each spot. So you can see the yellow ones are kind of alternating with the blue ones, and then the blue and yellow line alternates with the red and the purple line, so that you never have the same frequency overlapping itself and causing interference and, and causing issues. So you can have separate two-way communications within each of those beams. Now that I had to count them, but there are 76 circles up there. So using the same 400 megahertz, you end up with 7,600 megahertz of capacity that you're putting down. Uh, it's, it's not any faster, the capacity in between. You just happen to be able to use that frequency over and over again. And it's much the same that uh, cellular companies use. So they have the, the cell towers will reuse frequencies in, in a much similar type of pattern. And there's Anik F2's KA band high throughput spot beam laydown. And, uh, and that's just taken right from the website. And that's the, the first reuse of, of frequencies like that uh, in, in any band. And also the first satellite to provide satellite internet. So with the, uh, uh, a, a beam pattern like this, uh, the traditional satellite design, the, the, the payload design, has, has been quite fixed. Uh, you get, uh, so the, this again, my <laughs> amazing graphic skills, but you've got uh, basically the, the antenna is, is coming up on the, on the left, so you receive your signals through your antenna. The block represents some filtering and some, some redundancy type switching, but essentially, the, you get into the triangles where the, the power amplification takes place and you've got a high power signal coming out through the box, the same mirrored set of switches and, and filters on the, on the out end, and then output back down to, the, down to the earth. That's kind of a typical bent pipe, they call it. Your, your three channels are fixed. They're, you come up on channel one, you go down on channel one. You come up on channel two, down on channel two, um, which is... It's, it's really good for a lot of applications, really good when you have a, a, a really good sense of what your market needs are. Uh, but what reality is, is that needs are changing all the time. Uh, and you don't necessarily know your market before you put your satellite up. Uh, so you, you speculate a bit. You know you might need a lot of capacity in you know, Toronto and New York and, and the Eastern Seaboard and not so much over you know, the, the middle of the country, the prairies or or nothing over ocean. Uh, but you never know where you're going to get to, you know, you get into some more volatile markets like Latin America, eh, you just don't know who's going to pick up the services and, and, you know, your prospective customers come and go even before the satellite's up and built. So we have been pushing on our manufacturers to add flexibility in. So we might uh, add a switch into the boxes to be able to take channel one to channel one, but also from channel one to channel two. And maybe channel two goes to channel three and channel four, uh, but not fixed. So every component, every switch, every filter that we add on adds more cost, adds more mass, adds more power, our launch cost goes up, 
and the overall cost of cost per bit uh, is driven up. So we've been pushing on our manufacturers to, to develop more, more flexible payloads where your inputs, and you can have as many number of inputs as your, your system designs for as many number of outputs as you, you've designed, uh, but they can all be cross-strapped any which way they want. Uh, the idea is that anything can go up on any channel and come down on any channel. Uh, and there's, there's two sort of flavors of that. One is, uh, is channelizer without the digital part where it's uh, all at the, the radio frequency level and then a kind of a, a switch matrix level. And the other is a, a digitally processed channelizer where the signals come up and they actually get demodulated and decoded just like they would at, at the ground stations. Uh, and your satellite becomes kind of a router in, in space where the, the internet signal would come in and it would have a message in there to say, you know, send me down to channel two and send me down to channel five. Uh, so that's digitally processed payloads that add a lot of flexibility. Uh, so instead of spending a lot of time and money on, on really complex designs, you buy one of these and you can sort out your business case later. So it saves a lot of front end engineering. Um, so the Next step of this is, is in the antenna part and the, and the beams that come down. Uh, without something fancy on that end, you still have fixed beams where uh, channel one coming up comes from this one beam and channel two coming up comes from this other beam and channel one going down is over here and channel two over here. Yeah. So you still have this fixed layout. Uh, so one of the other, the other pieces to the totally flexible satellite is ground-based beam forming or uh, sometimes phased arrays are, are used as, as the implementation of this. But the, the idea is that uh, you can dynamically change this pattern. Um, so if you, you know, e either by time of day or by a change in the market, you can change your, your beam pattern and, and transfer power and bandwidth to different, uh, different layouts. So if you imagine it's midnight in Winnipeg and the entire eastern seaboard is, or the entire eastern side of the country is, is in bed, asleep, you might want to move some of the power to the western side where people are watching their cat videos and go to, uh, to some bigger spots over the east where your, your demand isn't quite as high. So it allows you to, to put less overall power on the board because you're not wasting anything. You can move your power and bandwidth as you need it uh, to where you need it. So that's, uh, those are really on the cusp of becoming, uh, becoming as cheap as the standard way of doing things and, and kind of the next step in, in satellite communication satellites. Uh, so those are kind of the payload innovations. Uh, one of the big bus side innovations, the spacecraft side, is in electric propulsion. So the, the typical satellite GeoComSat, uh, uh, Animix 6, that provides the direct-to-home broadcast, about 2,000 kilograms of dry mass and about another 2,000 kilograms of propellant just to get it from where the rocket leaves us up to geosynchronous orbit. Uh, so basically double the spacecraft mass uh, just to get us on station and, and operating. Uh, Electric propulsion uses, uh, uses some really high power uh, electric fields to accelerate a gas to extremely high speeds. Uh, they just use a lot less of it. Is that so an ion drive? It's an ion drive, yeah. Okay. Yeah, or a, a plasma thruster or a Hall effect, a Hall effect thruster. They use that on satellites now? Yeah, they've been using electric propulsion for uh, some north south station keeping okay. for, for quite some time. Yeah, uh, actually NIMIC, NIMIC 1 and 2 uh, launched in the 90s, both have arc jets. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the innovation here is that now there's no chemical propulsion system on board at all. So you save yourself the, the 2,000 kilogram tank of fuel and all the, the, the hardware that comes with it, and you use a little bit higher power uh, to use these electric thrusters. So as you see there, the, the total transfer orbit 
fuel needed is, is in the 100 to 200 kilogram range, so a, like a 90% savings. That's a, a ton of mass, and if you're launching at you know, $10,000 a kilo to, to the geosynchronous transfer orbit, that's a, that's a ton of money saved. Does it help extend the life of the satellite? Um, not much effect on it. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it comes down to the satellite design still, it, it, not a direct correlation. But it does have a life consequence, uh, and the cost, of, of, uh, the cost of electric propulsion comes in, in your transfer orbit itself. So this is my really simplified geosynchronous transfer system. Uh, so you'd be launched from the Earth in the center there into the elliptical orbit uh, from, you know, the, the Proton or, or Falcon 9 would launch into that ellipse and the, the fuel on board the satellite has to take it to the, the circularized geosynchronous and that's what costs the, the big portion of that fuel. Um, it's not this simple. Uh, this is the, uh, the Proton diagram for a, a geosynchronous launch and transfer. Uh, it's Quite a bit more complex, but essentially the same thing. You're, you're still using basically your spacecraft mass in chemical propulsion propellant to, to get on station. The electric transfer is much different. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't do big uh, impulse burns like the chemical propellants. The electric, pro uh, the electric systems will, will operate continuously and sort of spiral you out much, uh, much more slowly. So where a chemical propulsion system will take you from GTO or from launch to geosynchronous to in a couple of weeks, now with the electric propulsion, you're looking at between four to 12 months. So you save a whole bunch of mass and, and hopefully a whole bunch of money on your launch, uh, as long as your business case can survive a, an extra, you know, three and a half to, to year to get on station. So if you're really good and, and planned well ahead of time, then you're in good shape. Uh, the mass savings, uh, if anybody's doing the math, and I said double the satellite mass for the propellant, if you launch a satellite for 4,000 kilograms and then take 2,000 kilograms off of it, well, you've got 2,000 kilograms left. So that's 2,000 kilograms for another all-electric propulsion satellite. And we've seen this uh, happening more and more often where launches are shared with two smaller satellites or, or larger all-electric propulsion satellites. Uh, so on the left here, you've got the, the proton stacked configuration that's sort of been the, the, the go-to in the last few, few years. Uh, the, uh, the, the other side is the, the Lockheed Martin side-by-side. Uh, and Lockheed came up with this because in the stack configuration, nobody seems to want to be on the bottom. Uh, <laughs> goes, goes for more than just that, I guess. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the trick is that the, the, earth, uh, the earth face is basically lost on the, on the bottom satellite because you have to have the adapter for the satellite to sit on top of it. So if you look at the, the Lockheed satellites side by side, those, those top decks there with the three, the three dishes, that's the Earth deck. Uh, and that's what drove their decision to go side by side was that now they can get all the capability and everything in a, in a skinnier package, but still have that Earth deck that's really prime real estate because that's the part that points at Earth and, and where all your money is coming from. So the, uh, all your sensors and, and antennas can now sit on that Earth deck with, where it's really desirable to have them. Um, the Lockheed ha solution also relies, if you look at the, uh, the panels, the blue big squares on the, on the stacked configuration on the left, those are the solar arrays. The, uh, the white bars are Lockheed's, uh, Lockheed's solar arrays. They're, they're a flexible, unfurlable array. So these big, big squares are, are just big panels that are hinged, and there might be four or five hinged panels coming out. Uh, Lockheed's adapted the ISS mm -hmm. flexible array to, to geosatcoms and, and now they can just roll them out. That's really what allows them to get that skinny. One of the other innovations, I've talked about this at the RISC before, is, is small satellites. Uh, 
the whole Moore's law idea of, of electronic shrinking, uh, you know, making something smaller and, and more capable. Uh, and this is Team Concordia that won the, uh, the CSDC2. Uh, and if, if you haven't seen it, this is a, a 3U CubeSat, that little black thing in the middle that, uh, that's about the size of a, a milk carton. Uh, it's four kilograms. It's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters. Uh, I can't remember exactly what their mission was, but they do a lot of, of interesting science and application missions with just a tiny little, almost a, you know, almost a small computer size. Uh, so that has spawned a lot of questions as to whether this can be grown into satellite communications. And the, the, the reason it hasn't become ubiquitous yet is that satellite communications requires a really high power amplification to get over the, the distance loss that you get in your signal. So what we see here, and if everybody's been following any kind of news in SATCOM, oh sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll talk Cassiopeia first. Uh, there, there has been a little bit of a shift towards communications and, and Cassiopeia was sort of the first, one of the first small sats to, to put communications as a, as, a, as a payload. Its primary service is, is uh, Arctic weather monitoring but its secondary payload is what they call a, cur a courier store and, store and forward. So it can upload about a terabyte of information, circle through an orbit or two until it gets to over its target destination, and then download that, that information. So for Arctic weather monitoring stations that have a ton of data to, to transfer somewhere but no fiber connection, not a, bad, not a bad plan. You can upload the data, get it back a couple hours later, not really time sensitive, not bad. Um, certainly proves the, the, the high data rate transfer because the stations are only going to see it for about 10 or 15 minutes every, every orbit. So getting that much information up to a satellite in, in the first place is, is uh, a pretty big feat. So small satellites and communications uh, kind of converge. Uh, and this is a, a, a Canadian uh, initiative, Comstellation. It's a company called MSCI that first conceived this orbital configuration. Uh, and they proposed 72 uh, polar orbiting satellites uh, working in conjunction to provide global communications. Uh, so they, uh, they unfortunately have they lost their license for the constellation uh, back in December. But at about the same time, we've seen a lot of uh, high-profile announcements from uh, the likes of uh, Greg Weiler with OneWeb and Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic and Qualcomm and, and Elon Musk and, and his SpaceX company uh, talking about these massive constellations of, of supposedly very cheap satellites providing global internet coverage and, and specifically targeting the, those regions that aren't already served by, by terrestrial means. Um, so this is the, the SpaceX 4000 satellite uh, <laughs> proposal. Um, and that's basically, that's a, you know, it's, a, it's an entire internet network in the sky. Uh, so 4000 satellites and, and about the size of a toaster. Uh, I think he's just recently announced that he is, uh, he's launching a couple of pilot satellites or hoping to. Um, so that's interesting. I, it's, you know, it's an economies of scale that they're driving for is that the more you build, the cheaper you can bulk buy all your bits and pieces and components, uh, and the better you get at building each one so you can build them faster and cheaper as you go along. So uh, constellation at 72, you get a certain price break for, for your bulk buy at, at, at that many. I guess Elon's shooting for the next bulk buy at a couple orders of magnitude higher. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm almost glad that uh, that I had to delay the talk to this time because I couldn't say that. What I can say now is that Telesat actually has been granted a license to operate one of these networks, and we aren't going anywhere near 4,000 satellites. We're uh, we're going to keep it down around around 40 or 50, um, but we're looking at, uh, at at the technology, and it's it's really very close to. To being more capable than, than geo satellites at, at a better cost, um, and uh, and you get the added benefit of uh, of low latency. So the the time it takes a signal to travel up to geo and back 
is, is just shy of a second and it puts it just out of the realm of, of really natural sounding voice communications, let alone FaceTime or, or Skype if anybody's into that. Um, but at these low Earth orbiting levels, you know, a thousand kilometers, twelve hundred kilometers, the, the latency drops down to, you know, the, the less than a half a half a second and you're now it's it's voice communications becomes much more realistic. Uh, and video video calls become more realistic. So is that the killer application? Uh, we don't know. We'll uh, We'll, we'll keep working the, the system and see if it comes up to that, that magic cost per bit. Are you monitoring the progress of landlines? And lines going across uh, the ocean? Yes. Um, it, it's, it's more on the market side that they're worrying about that, but it's, uh, there's still areas that... Like a, the fiber trunks going across carry a, a big backhaul across the oceans. Uh, these constellations are targeting areas that just will never get fiber because there's just too few people per square kilometer. So it's targeting the really low population density areas of the Earth that you're just not going to go put put the terrestrial stuff into. So that's a uh, that's it for the talk. I like to kind of throw things up there and, and leave time for questions. So I mean we've done a few as we go along, but. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so the question is whether the, the satellites talk to each other or whether they talk to the Earth. Uh, each satellite talks only to the Earth. Um, it's it's uh, inter-satellite links is what they call it. And, and I know that, that Elon Musk has, has talked about having them. Uh, the the, the trade-off is, is that with inter-satellite links, you have a, a much more complex satellite. So the satellites have to know not just who they're supposed to be talking to on the ground, but what other satellites they're able to see and where they have to be pointing or, or, or talking to, to get their message to where it needs to go. Um, the, the savings on the other side is that uh, you don't need as many ground stations. So if every satellite has to only talk to the ground, then you need a ground station within view of every satellite for it to be able to provide a service. Uh, with an inter-satellite link, you don't necessarily need the ground station under each satellite. It can send its data, it, it can take the, the data from the remote site, hop it over a couple of satellites that does have a connection to a ground station and come down. So that's, uh, that's something we're looking at as well and, and it's a, a complex trade space. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really why I want to keep my constellation down as, as low as possible. Um, I, I do the math, you know, a 1% failure rate on orbit with 4,000 satellites means you have 40 pieces of space, space junk in your orbit. Uh, that's a lot of conjunctions, that's a lot of, a lot of debris you don't want to be chasing around. And that's, and that's just constellation one. Uh, his design life is intended to be five years. So that means you got to put another 4,000 up in five years. So that's another 1%. So there's 80 pieces. And then in another five years, you got another four. Uh, well, he does sell uh, rocket ships. So. Yeah, I, I think that's a big motivator for him is, is that he keeps the, the rocket factory full too, right? Constipation. <laughs> Constipation, yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened to Iridium? Is it still operational? Yeah, Iridium is still operational. So this is, this is what makes the... the the business case really interesting is that there have been other constellations. So Iridium is a, a satellite phone constellation. Uh, Orbcom does machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, low data rate uh, constellation. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Global Star is, a, is another uh, constellation of, of basically internet traffic. Uh, every one of them has gone bankrupt uh, and been rebought and resold. But every one of them is now into generation two. So 
maybe at least at pennies on the dollar, the business case starts to make sense. But uh, Iridium Next has started to launch. Uh, O3B is the, the latest new entrant. Uh, they are what we call a MEO, where they, these ones are kind of a thousand kilometers. O3B is up at about 8,000 kilometers. So instead of needing 72 or 4,000, they need 12 to kind of provide a, a decent global coverage. Um, I don't know, my, my sense is that's a bit of the worst of the both worlds where you're, you're still getting all the, the, the downside to LEO because you need more satellites to cover it, but you're high enough up that you're not getting many satellites onto a launch, and you're high enough up that the latency still does kind of matter a little bit. So yeah, we'll see how they do in the next little bit. As a taxpayer, yeah. considering the Canadian government's paying for a lot of this, what kind of return do they get, or do they get any? How about the profits? Because the electronics industry makes billions and trillions of dollars in profit. Does the government get anything back? Well, so Telesat is, is privately funded, and we, we finance all our own deals. Uh, we do do some business with the government, but uh, government revenues are, are less than 1% of, of of that revenue number that I gave earlier. So you know, we're, we kind of pride ourselves on that compared to some of the other operators who are have a much higher percentage of, of government involvement. Um, the, the net benefit comes uh, in, in being close to the, the supply chain. Um, so almost all of our satellites, well, I, it's probably safe to say that all of the satellites that we fly right now have components from, from Comdev on them. Uh, Comdev is, is world renowned for their, for their satellite payload components. Uh, MDA, uh, they're top of the world in satellite communications antennas technology. Uh, so that's, you know, those are two really successful Canadian businesses keeping engineers and technicians employed in Canada insofar as, as their other businesses are, are affected by, by government financial cutbacks. Um, so th there are those benefits. Um, in terms of, of providing connectivity to Canada, uh, Telesat connects the, the, the remote regions of Canada. Um, anywhere you're not linked up for, for terrestrial internet or, or cable is, is probably going over a Telesat satellite. Um, we, we recently did a, a, a survey of the, the cable head ends in, in remote communities. There are thousands uh, that, that they rely on C-band communications uh, on ANIC F2, ANIC F1R and ANIC F3 for, for their CBC and CTV and, and basic cable. Um, there was a, we had an anomaly on Anik F2 a few years back. Uh, it lost lock for, for a, good, a good day or so, and it shut down flights. People couldn't pay their, uh, pay with debit cards up north. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a vital link, um, and that's sort of the benefit that, that comes back to Canada in, in terms of connecting and, and growing the, the remote regions. There's a, a question over here. Yeah, two questions, if any. One is, if you're standing on the ground with your cell phone, whatever, maybe five years from now, are all of these things proprietary signals, or is there any common standard emerging so that you can communicate with more than one? That's question one. Question two is, that there's this website called spaceweather.com that lets us know whenever there's a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection. How much of a problem are those for your satellites? Two good questions. Uh, the, the first question was uh, whether the signals were proprietary and whether you could pick up any signal you wanted. Uh, with mostly no. Uh, each satellite will have its own set of frequencies uh, and its own set of uh, your, your decoder box uh, on your that comes with your Bell Express view, you need to have the, the electronics in there that will decode that signal coming from that satellite. So the signals might be the same. You can receive the signals, no problem. 
uh, you just put up a dish and, and, a, and, and a receiver, it'll tell you what the signal's doing. But you need the, the electronics that will decode what the, what the RF signal means in terms of information. So that's the, 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 the distinguisher there. Um, and, and if you find a way to make uh, KA band receivable and, and interpretable by a mobile unit, please let me know. <laughs> uh, the other question was uh, the spaceweather.com and, and whether coronal mass ejections and solar flares and, and, and space weather in general have an effect on satellites. And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, the, the, the answer to the next question is no, we don't do anything about it. Um, because we really can't. Uh, we used to, uh, before my time, they used to actually turn the satellites to try and get the solar arrays uh, aligned so that the thin part of the array was facing the, the direction of the ejection with the thought that, oh, you know, we'll reduce the, the percentage chance that we're going to get hit by, by some, some high energy particles. But yeah, it, space is really big, so whether you've got a couple of meters wide or a couple of inches wide, it's, it's really about the same percentage chance, so you weren't saving anything, but you were stopping services during the time of that coronal mass ejection, and people didn't seem to like that too much, so we just grin and bear it. Last question. Uh, in regards to what you were just talking about with these constellations and the loss of data and the serious effect it's having, is more of the world is going to electronic data transfer for banking and everything else. Are, with the new generation of switching systems, are the various satellites that are in communication and going to be able to pick up the, if one satellite goes down, will they be able to pick up the, uh, the data so that service continues to be uninterrupted because we are moving to that being a necessity as much as having a hard day. Yeah, and that's, that's been driving our constellation design in, in terms of a, a kind of a system resiliency where in, in our setup, which is, which is different from both of those that you saw there, uh, every ground station in our service area will be able to see at least two satellites for you know, better than 90, 95% of the, the time. Um, so that's, that's one way. So you'd be able to hand off between satellite and, and, and satellite in, in that event. Uh, we're hoping that they come cheap enough that we can launch a couple of spares up into the orbit too, so that, that improves even more. So instead of having just two available, you'll, ha you'll have an option of three. Um, and then the, the other little bit that sneaked in there was just the, the, the network connectivity of which satellite has to talk to which ground station when and where and as it's flying over at, uh, you know, with a, a 15 minute pass, where's its next one going? Where are all these? It's, it's a really big complex software algorithm that, that has to get solved before these things are really, really ready to fly. But I think we've got about eight years to figure it out. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Chris, you're probably going to have to fill me in on this, but this is a. Gordon tried to act his chair and hadn't seen these slides before. So <laughs> Or the South Pole. Good. Okay, so we're going to do the observation reports. Okay, uh, Shane. Might let him change. So I'll let you advance. I'll just let you know when. Um, so this is a picture of my solar observatory, as you can see. Uh, you can advance it now. Shane, can you speak to the crowd? Sorry. Yep. Uh, this is a picture of my solar observatory, aka my backyard, and. Um, on the right hand side there is a list of the equipment that I'm using and uh, how I process my images. <laughs> yes, he's a very good observatory assistant. He's great at fetching me things. So. 
Um, as you can see from my pool condition, I noticed that I should have taken the picture after I cleaned it, but uh, <laughs> I've been doing an awful lot of uh, solar observing lately. And uh, I got motivated back in March. Um, basically, I was reading some stuff about the um, uh, eclipse in 2017 and uh, got motivated, started reading some more and realized I was never really truly happy with my uh, hydrogen alpha imaging. I always found it to be, uh, the resolution wasn't very good and it was kind of muddy, so I decided I'll start using this time to uh, refine the process and uh, figure out where I'm going wrong and do the best with what I've got. Now, as you'll notice, I don't do any stacking. I'm using a basic 7D camera and that's partly motivated by me being <laughs> lazy. I don't like taking thousands of pictures, going through them, finding the best ones, stacking them, and then processing. So, and there's also a motivation there to find a different solution to uh, uh, the same problem, and that is how to get a, as decent a picture as you can uh, with minimal, obviously, effort. But I just like the approach that if you can do it in one and you get your processing in one, why not? Let's try it. So, that was my motivation. Um, like I said, since March, I've been doing an awful lot of these images. It got to the point where um, I was happy enough, I started posting them on Facebook, uh, asking for feedback, just to see what other people thought, because you start getting pictures and you go, hey, that looks pretty good. You know, am I deluding myself? So I started posting them, getting feedback. This became almost a daily event, and um, that's where the Sun TV came up, because it became a joke where looking at my Facebook page was kind of like looking at Sun TV. So I decided to create a logo and embrace it. So there you have it, Sun TV. Uh, we can advance to the next one. <coughs> so if you've been looking at uh, space weather, um, for the most part, it's been pretty unremarkable. There's not a lot of things happening. Um, I would differ on that one. And uh, obviously the pictures to proceed will help me illustrate that. but. What I found was the sun is far more dynamic than I was expecting and dynamic to the point where uh, within 30 minutes and an hour, uh, things can change considerably. Um, the part that is, uh, well, May 19th to my, May 23rd, uh, I don't have those pictures in these slides. I have it as a video later. I took uh, five days of images and uh, I spliced them together to create a, uh, a short video. Uh, you'll notice on uh, April 14th, basically it's really not saying much. And this was actually a pretty interesting day. Um, the next one, obviously, explosion on the sun, that gets, catches everybody's attention. But after that, it's relatively quiet. It doesn't seem like there's any real great reason to pull out your scope. I would say bring out your scope and have a look. There's lots going on. Want to advance it? So you can't see it really well here. You might want to dim the lights a little bit and see if it improves. But this is a picture of the sun on April 14th. Uh, hit it again. And if we can dim the lights a little bit, because there's a large CME on the right-hand side. I showed this last month, but I'm so happy with this shot, I snuck it in again, because I really want to show this one off. But that was a CME that extended out about 550,000 kilometers. No mention of it at all on space weather. And as you can see by the image of Earth, I mean, this is gigantic. And uh, obviously with the sunspots, quite busy uh, solar activity going on. Definitely worth having a look at. Next image. And then again, and then advance it again. Um, you kind of get a better idea of it there. Yeah. So this was a, a huge CME. And within 30 minutes, it was gone. So as I was taking pictures of it, it was disappearing. And uh, I was lucky to get this shot. And like I said, I don't do a lot of heavy processing. So unfortunately, when you're looking at the whole disk, it kind of looks dim and un, un, uh, unwell, underwhelming. How long is that? Does that extend out to there? Yeah, that's 550,000. That's, that's all the way? Yes, sir. Wow. And the moment I saw it in the scope, I knew I wanted to get a picture of this. I ran back in the house, got the camera, set it all up. I was taking pictures. And as I said, as I was taking the picture, it was disappearing. And I can even show you the series of shots and you can see it diminishing. The interesting thing too is if you assume that this happened in an hour, which was roughly the time frame that I was thinking, um, the fastest space probe ever was the Helios 2 when it was going around the sun and that was 
but for a very brief period of time going 70 kilometers per second. It would still, still take several hours for to cover that distance. Yet this did it, did it in under an hour. Next image. So on April 28th, that's the explosion. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, you can see the filament extending out and then of course it explodes out. Um, again, I mean, two in, May, uh, two in April and I'm hooked. I started taking pictures just about every day I could after this because I realized that, uh, quiet or not, there's some pretty remarkable things happening. That, that looks like a shadow on the right, but it's definitely not a shadow. Exactly. That's the, that's the filament, and then the filament actually extends out beyond the, the disc and is part of that explosion. And then, of course, you can see another large filament about 5 o'clock, and then there's a small one up in the top left about 10 o'clock. And then there, there's some brighter patches happening, but not sunspots just yet. Next image. This one was pretty interesting. This was a filament that I was watching. I had to cull a lot of pictures out of this. I could have been talking for an hour and showing you many, many pictures. But this was a good example of a filament that extended out. This is easily half the disk, so if the disk is almost 14 or 1.4 million kilometers, then this is about 700. Within the next few days, it actually almost covered the entire disk from uh, limb to limb. And then a few, day, uh, a few days after this image, part of it collapsed and caused another explosion uh, and a minor CME. Next image. May 13th. Uh, if anybody was watching in the emails, Simon Hammer uh, posted an email about this one. Uh, he said, basically, if anybody has a solar scope, get out there and look at the sun now. This is why. Um, obviously, lots of sunspot activity crackling away and uh, this beautiful prominence on the uh, top. And this lasted several days and took many different shapes. Um, next image. So on May 28th, I went out and I took a picture. As you can see, it's a little bit fuzzy, muddy. It was kind of a cloudy-ish day, uh, but I wanted to get a good picture of it because there was this beautiful V-shape uh, uh, filament. And of course, as you can see from the prominences, there's quite a few prominences. But an hour later, next image, if you take a look at uh, about uh, 7, 8 o'clock, you see that uh, large looping um, prom prominence. That's an hour difference. Obviously, the sky's improved a little bit because you can see it's crisper and uh, you get more sharpness. And next image. And that's essentially full resolution shot flipped and I threw in a little pale blue dot to represent Earth. But that happens in an hour. So that's why I was saying. Um, I know a lot of people have solar telescopes and then if you're watching space weather, you're going to think, oh, not really worth going out. There's not much activity. There's lots of stuff happening out there. Next image. And then on May 30th, um, between clouds, it was one of those days where I think I had a total window of about maybe 40 minutes before it clouded over. And uh, I got this one. Again, you can see remnants of that V-shape uh, filament and then the large prominence as well. But uh, work, working from home has its advantages. and. Uh, I set my scope up every time I can and uh, go out there and if I see anything interesting, which tends to be almost every day, uh, I uh, take pictures and post it on Sun TV. I also have two videos. You're going to play the first one, that's May 19th to May 23rd. Um, you, know, you can just watch the progression of the uh, different features and uh, that first segment was through fast. This one's going to go a little slower and then it'll go fast again. But if you focus on that filament, the sunspot, uh, slightly about 2 o'clock right now, you'll see it actually forming. It starts in the center right now, and then it moves across. And you can see that the filament uh, gets bigger as it's going across, as it's forming. Interesting stuff. And then the last one was an interesting one. This was a solar x-ray. Um, obviously not my picture but I threw it in there to uh, show you representation of it. And then if you take a look, I put arrows to show you what I think I caught was the x-ray happening. Uh, that day, for I used the one skill that I rely on the most, and that's serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> I just decided that I was going to take pictures as many times as I could through the day. 
and uh, see if I could capture anything changing. And lo and behold, I catch an X2 uh, solar burst. And as you can see, the sky was changing. It started out as cloudy-ish. It got a little bit clearer, and then it got cloudier. So as you can, if you could play that one again, maybe. If you watch the solar disk, you can kind of see where the resolution kind of goes in and out. Is it possible? Got to push on. OK. That's it. Thank you. Thank you Bob. Bob Wilson. Oh, there you are. Chris, if you want to turn the house lights down completely, please. Can you do that? What's that? Turn down the lights from the podium. I won't be able to read my notes. <laughs> um, in May, we had eight days where I got my telescope out to do some observing, which is pretty good for around here. Um, this is M27. Uh, it's about a four or five hour exposure. Uh, in, it, it's, uh, I take pictures in luminance, red, green, and blue, and also in hi hydrogen alpha. Uh, it's, uh, the telescope is a 12 and a half inch home built Newtonian imaging scope. And I'm taking uh, images with a camera, uh, an astronomical camera, which has a chip the same size as your standard uh, DSLR. It's a uh, three quarters of an inch across. So it's, it's an all new equipment for me. I'm having great fun with it. Okay, next slide. And uh, this is N51, uh, same equipment, same time, probably four or five hours. And I, in the eight days that I was imaging, there's a whole bunch of things which I've imaged a hundred times before, but they were almost straight overhead. So uh, N51 uh, circles around up over top of the sky. Right now it's really high in the sky. It's just a fa fabulous thing to look at and to image. It's great fun. Uh, and uh, it never changes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's a it's a it's a it has a Kodak 8300 chip, which is a, a just an APS size chip, and it's a Starlight uh, Express camera made by Starlight Company in uh, United in uh, England. Okay. Mounted on what scope? It's mounted on a 12 inch Newtonian uh, f4. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Hi hey everybody, I've got a few things to show you tonight. I'll start close to home and work my way out into the universe, as it, as it were. Um, Comet Lovejoy is still six months later, after putting on a spectacular show in the early part of the year, is, uh, is still visible and it's still an easy uh, binocular and uh, telescope target for even a small telescope. It's currently hanging in near Polaris. I took this shot about two weeks ago and you can see the, uh, you can see the, uh, the comet there. And uh, not much of a tail left on it anymore, certainly not visible in binoculars and even long, longer exposure uh, images uh, don't, don't uh, only show the faintest hint of a tail there, but uh, coma is still quite, quite obvious there and uh, I picked that up in, uh, in just uh, in uh, 15 minutes of exposure. This was a 200 millimeter lens uh, with a Canon 60D8 just on a sky tracking platform. And uh, that cluster down there, that's uh, NGC 188. So, and that's Polaris up there. So, very close to Polaris. It's gonna be up there for a little while. Uh, you can even try taking your own photographs if you want because when something is close to Polaris like that, you can actually put your camera on a tripod and leave it open for a minute, minute and a half. Um, and, uh, and, and get very little star trailing. So give it a try if you're interested. All right, a little farther out into space. There we go. So that's the horse head I shot in the winter. Uh, this is just with hydrogen alpha. So it's, uh, hydrogen alpha is in the red part of the spectrum. And uh, so I left, uh, I left it as red there and you can see the, uh, uh, I managed to get some, uh, some nice detail in the, in the horse's uh, mane and uh, other other areas there. The uh, the Horsehead Nebula, also known as Barnard 33, is part of the Orion uh, uh, molecular complex. There, it's an active star forming region. We know that there are stars forming in that dark, dusty pillar right now. So, uh, yeah, probably in the uh, well, it, it will be eroded and the material will be used. So it's not certainly a permanent feature. But for now, it's a horsehead. So giddy up. <laughs> All right, next one. 
That one, yeah, that's looking quite uh, quite saturated on that on that view there. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, that looks much better on my monitor. But it's uh, this is uh, just the uh, Milky Way. You can see the, the the summer triangle there with the uh, with the Milky Way running through it there. And this was uh, uh, um, it's amazing how quickly that comes up. That was just a stack of four uh, two minute exposures, so eight minutes in total. And uh, yeah, the stars are really, really bright on this image that I'm seeing here. They are much more subdued, and you could see the Milky Way a bit more there. So, say it'll be lessons learned. Um, so, leaving our galaxy, the next one out is uh, M64, Black Eye Galaxy. That's 24 million light years from from here, and uh, that one, I, that one uh, was a fairly long piece of work there. I used actually two different cameras on uh, on my 11 inch Edge HD to to do this. Uh, one was a uh, one, uh, one shot color imager, and uh, another one was uh, um, a monochrome camera, so that I could get all the color bands in one, and then I could also use the uh, monochrome imager to do luminance and uh, and hydrogen alpha to pick up, uh, especially the the detail in there. This is an interesting galaxy. Uh, what what studies have shown about this galaxy is that uh, it is, as you can see, a, a spiral galaxy. It looks reasonably normal, otherwise, other than the evil eye looking at you there. Um, but the, uh, the, the gas in the disk is actually two counter-rotating disks of gas, which is really quite unusual. Uh, there's no real evidence that the stars in, 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 in the inner and the outer part of the galaxy are, are, are rotating in opposite direction. They seem to be operating or rotating in the same direction. It's just the, the interstellar gas there that, uh, that seems to be in, in opposite rotations there. So one of, the, one of the theories for this galaxy is, is that uh, they think it was a merger of uh, perhaps a gas-rich galaxy got gobbled up, cannibalized by the larger galaxy some time ago, and the gas was just incorporated, and that galaxy would have been going in a sort of a retrograde motion. So it's an interesting object uh, in, up in Coma Berenices, and uh, that's a, a total exposure of about, uh, just under four hours in, in, in the various bands to get the, uh, to, to get the detail. Okay, and the last one. This is an unusual one. I just finished this one. This is um, this is Abel 20, 2065. It's a it's a it's a cluster of galaxies, and uh, it's very distant. It's it's about a billion light years from here, so it's oh, almost ten percent of the way across the universe. It's very very distant, and um, this is uh, in the in the Corona Borealis constellation. It's uh, it's part of the Corona Borealis supercluster of galaxies, which really just we we sort of just got into the concept of of superclusters of galaxies in the late 1950s, um, and uh, and really more recent work in the in the 80s and the 90s to confirm that these things are actually conglomerates of clusters of galaxies, and uh, Abel 2065 is the richest uh, richest um, of the uh, of the uh, galaxy clusters in that particular Corona Borealis supercluster. So this is a, a about a two hour exposure and. Uh, it's, I, I'm, I'm just blown away by this because the image actually shows evidence of the expansion of the universe. You saw in the previous slide the, that nice bluish color of the, of the, of that we're used to seeing in the, in the, uh, in the uh, disks of most uh, uh, spiral galaxies. What you notice here is that, especially in the larger members of the cluster, is that they're kind of yellowish green. And that's because this cluster is so distant, as I say, about a billion light years from here, it's moving away from us at about seven or eight percent the speed of light. And so its, oops, its blue light is already shifted into the, into the green and, and yellow portion of the spectrum, even at that distance. So, and this, was, this cluster was actually used back in the, in the, uh, in the 1930s uh, by Humison and uh, Edwin Hubble uh, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as evidence for uh, the recently developed theory of galactic, uh, of universal expansion. So, uh, rather interesting cluster. As I say, this is a, this is a, the other thing with this image is, is that actually most of the things that you see in this cluster are galaxies, they're not stars. There's a, you know, there's a few obviously bright stars there, but uh, many of the objects, even at, in, the, in the two hours exposure that I did, uh, are, are galaxies that are in that in that one image as part of that cluster? There's over 200 galaxies visible, and just to put it in perspective, the area of the sky that you're looking at. I brought a BB. Most of you know what a BB is, right? BB. 
So the area, the, the area of that image is about half the size of that BB held at arm's length. And there's 200 galaxies in there. That kind of stuff just blows me away. Anyway, so yeah, oh, there goes the universe. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you want to do this, Chris? Oh, you're going to do it? Okay, great. So, uh, so those of you who are uh, members of the uh, Canadian Science and Technology Museum uh, would have probably received an email about this, but for those of you who did not, um, they are currently seeking public consultations on the uh, layout of the museum and the, and the content and so on and so forth. This is also in the Citizen. Uh, there is an online survey, I would encourage you to do that. One of the things that jumped out at me was um, around the entranceway, they're planning to put uh, bright LED lights to illuminate the entrance, which should do a really good job of washing out the uh, telescope. And this is an opportunity to possibly encourage them to put some more money into the telescope, update the auditorium, various other things. So I encourage you to uh, complete the survey. The, uh, the address is right there on the screen. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the RASC National Office is putting together a tour uh, for the eclipse, it's down through the, uh, well, you can read it, Grand Tetons and, and Yellowstone National Park. And there are the prices and the dates. And I hear that it's filling very fast, so if you're interested, I suggest you act quickly. Okay, so we have the, um, the Carp Star Party is on tomorrow night, the weather permitting. It looks good, though. Um, just keep an eye on your email for the go, no go call sometime tomorrow afternoon. Okay. That How take, does it run till? Uh, I think they go till one o'clock. Well, we 12.30? There you go. Okay, and it takes place in the parking lot there by the uh, Diefen Bunker and the Carp Library. And this is the calendar of, of coming star parties. Okay, so the rain date would be next weekend on either the 12th or the 13th. Uh, Cube Gallery having their annual event. <coughs> What's the date on? July 1st. Three different astronomy events there. July 1st, July 2nd, and then the following weekend are almost the Thursdays of July 9th. Okay. They'll certainly be looking for volunteers. I suspect Mike Bogan will be sending out emails soliciting volunteers to uh, help out with that. Okay, and are they getting the, the street lights turned off again? They typically do that uh, on at least one of the nights they get the uh, street lights in the neighborhood turned off. Okay, with well, a little bit of a star party. Yeah. Okay, Estelle's pick of the month, star testing astronomical telescopes. And that's uh, uh, just behind here, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, in fact, we want to highlight that uh, we reopened the library last month, but a lot of people didn't know where it was. But if you could navigate your way through black curtains behind Gordon, you will get to the uh, back uh, storage room and the Stella and her library. There's a bright light back there. There seems to be, it seems to be spinning in a circle. There's a dark center. I'm not sure where you'll end up, but. <laughs> okay, next, uh, Gary. Is that the yep, you can do the announcement on this. Yeah, just one quick reminder. Last month on May 16th, the uh, blue, um, Blue Gypsy Winery had a star party. It was a fundraiser for uh, service dogs for veterans and first responders. We had 40, 40 guests that showed up. I had my uh, usual lecture, our cosmic origin. June 13th, which is next Saturday, same thing, the second Saturday night. Of course, we'd like to have you all out there. It's a donation of $10 per person. And it was very, very surprised that just for one guide dog, for eight years of service, $30,000, just for one dog. So uh, and Blue Gypsy also has a couple of other events for fundraising. So next Saturday, the 13th, rain or shine, I'll still be giving the, uh, the lecture inside and hopefully Mother Nature will let us show the lecture outside. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Uh, okay, so there's the, the post-meeting meeting at Perkins, just over on Salomon Boulevard. Uh, everybody's welcome. Okay, 
this uh, has been broadcast, right? And that's the address, and it's going to be uploaded to YouTube in a week or so? Yeah, about a week. Yeah. Okay. It's a monthly meeting. Our next meeting is what, July 8th? No, that doesn't make sense. Is it July 8th? July 3rd. July 3rd. That sounds better. We're also archiving past meetings of, on YouTube, so look for those on the website. There you go. That was what was confusing me. It's at 8 o'clock, July 3rd. <laughs> Okay, and so next next meeting, well, you can read it. We've got uh, Shane giving a talk on observing locations in the area, and Richard giving a talk on habitable planets. Okay. And we'll do, do the draw for door prizes. Okay, thank you all for coming. That's it? Okay. And also, the whoever has the National Geographic telescope over here, there was someone interested in it, so the two of you can connect over there. Thank you.